thought he'd keep it really simple and basic this afternoon, following Prabhupada's example. Prabhupada met with many great religious world leaders, like the Cardinal of France. They all wanted to talk high theology. But Prabhupada asked them, before we get into the theology and the high flute concepts about God, do you eat meat? Do you eat meat? And his principle was that if your diet is not pure, then your thinking is not pure. If your thinking is not pure, there's no way you're going to understand the supreme sudha, the supreme personality of Godhead. The journey to understand God, to come close to God, begins with what you put into your mouth. In other words, you are what you eat. <laughs> Coming down to us from thousands of years, both the Sanskrit word and the Hindi word for meat is mans. That's two single syllable words. Ma and se. Ma means me and se means him. You can't even say the Hindi or the Sanskrit word meat without acknowledging that what I do to him in this life, he gets to do to me in the next life. And so you see the man with the axe and then the cow with the man's head. Karma is action and reaction. You sow the seed, you face the deed. Whatever you do comes back to you. The law of cause and effect ensures the balance is perfect. Detecting whatever you do, good and bad, it will resurrect. Death is not the end, it's just a bend. Whatever you've done will circle back again. The body may die, but your karma is standing by. You'll be reborn to live and die, continue to suffer and cry. As the aroma follows the flower, as heat pursues the fire, your karma will track you as soon as you leave the funeral pyre. Karma decides how you'll be reborn, comely or scorned, high or humiliated, straight or deformed, animal or human, healthy or ill, long or short-lived. Karma's cause and effect right down there on the ground for those going over and around, up and down, bound by their deeds, drowned by their needs. Is there any purpose to our life on earth that we just die and continue to take birth? Is there any escape from the pain coming back again and again and again and again? Well, yeah. Because you're not the flesh, you're not the mind, eternal spirit designed in the image of Almighty Divine, assigned to a service sublime, attracted by unselfish action, serving the Lord with dispassion, acting only for His satisfaction, devoted souls achieve extraction from karmic reaction. If you want to burn up your karma, practice the dharma, pleasing the Lord, passion by His hand, act according to His plan, and never, ever, ever come back to this mortal world again. So we don't want to get entangled in one of the biggest entangling practices or habits is that of shedding the flesh of innocent animals. Because then you'll have to come back in your next life according to the law of balance, according to the law of justice, and experience what it's like to be on the other end of the fork. No one can say at that point, it's not fair. It is fair. It is fair. You are what you eat. So every day, at different times of the day, all over the world, People enjoy the universal ritual of sitting down and eating together. Most people decide what they're going to eat based on nutrition, based on taste, based on the cost of it, based on the convenience of it. They hardly ever consider in their choice of foodstuffs higher principles like mercy, compassion, effect on their consciousness. Those are rarely a concern. For most people, the purpose of food is to increase the duration of life. They're very concerned about bodily strength. And there's billions and billions of dollars put into nutritional research in the areas of manufacturing, packaging, preservation, transportation, nutrition, but rarely do we consider that the food we eat has an effect on our consciousness. Just like when you see a painting, the mood of that painter affects you. Similarly, Whatever the mood was of those who prepared the food, that's going to affect you. But we don't understand consciousness very well in our mechanistic, materialistic society. What we see, what we hear, what we eat, what we do, all of these activities affect our thoughts, our speech, our inner self, as well as our actions. Eating is not the least significant of all the things that we do, Therefore, we have to conclude that eating is going to have a profound effect on our consciousness. And it's not surprising that the Vedic literatures of India, which are all about purifying, elevating your consciousness, eventually bringing to a halt the revolution in the cycle of birth, death, disease, and old age, take up quite a bit of time discussing 
what we eat, when we eat, where we eat, and with whom we eat. The Bhagavad Gita, for instance, Krishna says, there are foods in the mode of goodness. They increase the duration of life. They purify one's existence, give strength, health, happiness, and satisfaction. Such foods are juicy, fatty, wholesome, pleasing to the heart. If you want to be peaceful, nonviolent, happy in yourself, not going around with a cloud of karmic reactions over your head, choose foods in the mode of goodness. Because we shape ourselves the joys and fears of which the coming life is made and fill our future's atmosphere with sunshine or with shade. The tissue of the life to be, we weave in colors all our own, and in the field of destiny we reap where we have sown. Now, in spite of a lot of emphasis on veganism nowadays, milk, especially the cow's milk, was valued by great saints and sages of India. Great sage named Sukadeva Goswami, who spoke the 20,000 verses of our text, the Srimad Bhagavatam, from memory, would simply subsist on one or two cups of milk a day. He would go to the door of a householder and ask, could I have a cup of milk? That milk would develop finer tissues within the brain so that he could be extremely well attuned to spiritual subject matters, also have a photographic memory. He heard the 20,000 verses of the Srimad Bhagavatam from his father, Veda Vyas, and then some days later he repeated it verbatim to Mars Preken. Milk has exceptional nutritional value. It's been proven by science. It has carbohydrates, it has proteins, it has the good kinds of fats. And if you're honest about it, most of the foods, aside from meat, that we really look forward to eating are byproducts of milk, aren't they? Butter, yogurt, cream cheese, sour cream, ice cream, ricotta. We have three preparations downstairs. All three, this is a, might be a record for us. <laughs> Mostly we have one, occasionally we have two, but you're here on a special day because we have three preparations in this evening's feast, all of which include paneer, which is homemade cheese made from the milk of a cow. All these things are conducive to higher thinking. Therefore, yogis, saints, and sages, milk was a big part of their diet. Not a lot of milk, 12 or 15 ounces of milk. And the cow was revered, not worshipped necessarily, but not killed either. Cow was seen as a mother. All of us subsist on the milk of our human mother for one or two years. But even after we stop drinking our mother's milk, we continue drinking for good brain substance, for good bones, for good energy. We continue drinking cow's milk our whole lives. The cow is regarded as a kind of mother. She's not killed. Wealthy philanthropists will often donate money to purchase land for go shalas. Go means cow and shala means shelter. So with the land purchased, they build a little simple shed to keep the old cows out of the weather and rather than kill a cow when it's no longer economically viable, they retire the cows to the Goshalas, where they live a simple life and die a natural death. No one in India wants to incur the karma of being responsible for the death of a cow. When I went to India for the first time in 1969 and then throughout the 70s, when you go to a shoe store, there used to be a little tag, a little sticker on every leather shoe. It reassured the customer that the leather was taken from a cow that had died a natural death. Can you imagine? But after about 1990, I didn't see those stickers anymore, so I don't even want to think about what that means. The Vedas recommend a vegetarian diet because as you sow, so you shall reap. What goes around comes around. We all want to have the maximum amount of happiness in our lives and the minimum amount of suffering. Well, now, if you could identify the cause of suffering, can you imagine? People want to stop the particular type of suffering called cancer. They want to stop the particular type of suffering called COVID. They want to stop the particular type of suffering called AIDS. And what do they do? What's the secret? You find the cause. When you eliminate the cause, then the effect is gone. So when they find the cause of COVID, then you get a vaccination and supposedly it eliminates the effect. What if you could identify one cause of all suffering? 
and very easily apply it. What's that application which basically reduces or minimizes all suffering? Be kind. Be considerate. Be sensitive. And someone says, well, I'm kind, I'm considerate, I'm sensitive. I help old ladies across the street. I open the door for ladies. I say, please, I say, thank you. I volunteer at the old age home once a week to show movies. But we have a blind spot in the Western culture. Pain is pain. It's not just that humans feel pain and animals don't feel pain. Pain is pain. There's no such thing as American pain or Chinese pain or cow pain or chicken pain. Pain is pain. Therefore, George Bernard Shaw wrote 100 years ago, we are the living graves of murdered beasts, slaughtered to satisfy our appetites. We never pause to wonder at our feasts if animals like humans could have rights. We pray on Sundays to have light, to guide our footsteps on the path we tread. We're sick of war, we don't want to fight, and yet we gorge ourselves upon the dead. Like carrying crow, we live and feed and meat, never considering the pain and suffering we cause. If thus we treat defenseless animals for sport or gain, how can we hope to attain the peace we say we are so anxious for? It's not at all surprising that eating is a whole science in a spiritual Vedic culture. So why do we eat foods, fruits, grains, vegetables, milk products, legumes, in the mode of goodness, and not eat other types of food? Well, it's the effect that it has on your consciousness. Here it's described foods in the mode of passion. They're too bitter, they're too sour, they're too salty, they're too hot, pungent, dry, burning. Those types of food are dear to those in passion. Those types of food cause distress, misery, and disease. People sometimes ask us why we don't eat onion and garlic. Well, onion and garlic are perfectly fine as short-term medicinal herbs. But when you eat onion and garlic every day, it makes you very, very quick to anger. Before a battle, <laughs> soldiers will they all eat a lot of onion and garlic. The Rajasthanis, before they would go into a fight, they'd eat a lot of onion and garlic. But hey, if you don't want to spend your whole life fighting with people at the office and in your home, back off from onion and garlic, because it has a rajashic effect on your consciousness. Then another type of food is food which is tasteless, decomposed, putrid, consisting of remnants of untouchable things. It is dear to those in the mode of darkness, principally meat products, products which are fermented, which bring about an intoxicated state, products which have been attained through the shedding of blood. These are all described as foods in the mode of ignorance. And those are foods which carry a heavy karmic price tag. The qualities which accrue to someone who eats food in the mode of goodness or higher thinking, cleanliness, satisfaction, self-control, wisdom, truthfulness, honesty, simplicity, and enthusiasm. And then you can read for yourself what are the effects of foods in the mode of passion and foods in the mode of ignorance. Therefore, we come to vegetarianism, wholesome, healthy, suitable, economic. Someone might ask, if you're worried about karma, if you're worried about causing pain and getting a reaction to the pain, what about carrots? What about potatoes? What about apples? What about grain? Aren't they living? Don't they have feelings too? And the answer is yes, they do. Yes, they do. However, most vegetarian food can be attained without killing. You milk a cow, the cow doesn't drop over dead. You pick an apple, it doesn't kill the apple tree. When you think about it, most grains and vegetables that we harvest the life force will have already left them because if you don't harvest them within a certain window, what happens? They rot. You can only, the body can only rot once the soul is exited. So we eat the grains when they're brown. They don't have any particular use to us when they're green. So by nature's arrangement, if you're a vegetarian, you're reducing your karmic overload by a factor of thousands and thousands of times. But you're not eliminating altogether. What about that baby carrot that you ate yesterday? You cut it down in the prime of its life. Who knows what it would become if it had grown up to be a full, mature carrot. Well, yeah, you've got a point there. And so we don't stop at vegetarianism. We go further and have a deeper look at the whole syndrome. Vegetarian comes from a Latin word, which is vegas, and means whole, sound, fresh, 
or lively. A vegetarian diet implies not only a balanced diet of vegetables and fruits, but also a balanced philosophical and moral sense of life. So what's philosophical, what's moral about food? To recognize that it just doesn't come about by accident. There's a supreme intelligent designer who created us, who loves us, and who is amply provided for us. Nitya nityanam chaitanas chaitanam eko yo bharadati kamam. In the Shredasvatara Upanishads, it says, Nitya, the one supreme eternal Lord and Father and Creator, Nityanam has provided all the necessities of life for the plural eternals who are his parts and parcels. He has amply equipped this planet for more than enough food for even 10 times its population. And when you eat according to the prescription of God, you get more stamina, you live longer, you have sharper thinking powers. I used to run marathons, not recently, <laughs> not this millennium. In the 80s and 90s, I ran 32 marathons as a vegetarian. What you would do before marathons is carbo-load. You eat pastas, you eat complex carbohydrates. Those will give you the stamina that you need to run a long race. Not simple sugars, because they'll just go through. Certainly not meat, because it doesn't have carbohydrates. The protein that you get in meat derived it from a plant source. So the protein you get from plant sources is first-hand direct protein. So we would always go and have pasta, fruit, grains, vegetables before a marathon, because that was the optimal food for completing an endurance race like that. It's similarly the optimal food for completing 80, 90, 100 year race, also called life. And even in my 40s and 50s, I wasn't able to compete with the world-class athletes who came first, second, and third, but I was almost always in the top five in my age group, 40 to 45, 50 to 54. I used to sell cookies to raise money for this temple and when it would get cold, I would go down in a little motor home with lots of cookies down to Los Angeles. I belonged to a running club there in Riverside. We would run up Mount Rubidoux on Saturday mornings and other days we'd go to races. And there was a fellow there named Greg. He was exactly my age. We had birthdays within a week of each other. And he was actually more cut, more ripped, more athletic looking than I was. But I always beat him when we go to the five and 10 Ks. He was extremely competitive, and you could see it really, really rankled him that I was able to beat him in the races. And finally, one day, he couldn't stand it anymore. He said, Charu, what do I have to do to beat you? And I said, well, Greg, we train together. We run the same amount of miles every week. We do the same amount of speed work on the UCR track there. We're the same age. The only difference that I can see between you and me is that I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> He did not want to go there. He loved his meat, but he wanted to beat me even more. So he gave up his meat. And sure enough, about 30 days later, he started beating me. Worse and worse and worse and worse. As far as I know, he never went back to it as well. Not only do you get more stamina, more power, but also you can recover much more quickly. I don't know if you've seen the Game Changers. They do the science that the protein that you get from meat is what causes the lactic acid, the soreness the next day. The same protein derived from first-hand source of vegetables, it's not inflammatory. Athlete after athlete after athlete has said, since I became a vegetarian, I can go and do back-to-back -back exercises without getting sore or without having to take time off. Lower cholesterol levels, lower blood pressure, reduce risk of cancer by 40%, reduce risk of diabetes, what else? 90 to 97% of heart disease can be prevented by a vegetarian diet. They did a big study among the Seventh-day Adventists. Again, we used to sell cookies down in San Bernardino, and they have a huge medical complex down there called Loma Linda. You can get all the statistics that Seventh-day Adventists are, have a 90% lower mortality rate, 90% lower rate of death from heart attacks, from diabetes and things like that. Moving on here, because we've got a half an hour, and I want to get to the spiritual point of it. Most of our anatomy corresponds with those of herbivores and not of carnivores. For instance, 
The intestinal tract of a tiger is 20 times shorter than our intestinal tract. That means he eats the meat and he gets rid of it really quickly. Human beings who eat meat, it stays in there much longer, it has much further to travel, and that's why one of the biggest cancers in America is colon cancer. There are even kids in their teens that have colon cancer from McDonald's that they ate 10 years ago. Also, the stomach acid of the tiger is 20 times stronger than our stomach acid. So that means not only does it travel from one end to the other quicker, but it breaks down much more quickly as well. And even though we have four canine teeth as a concession that if we ever have to in times of excessive cold or famine, have to as a last resort eat meat, most of our teeth, you'll know, are flat. They're molars. Tiger doesn't have any molars. Tigers can't eat salads because they don't have that side-to-side -side action. They just slash, tear, and swallow. We have mostly molars, and those molars are for chewing, salad, fruits, grains, leaves, and vegetables. And we act according to the construction of our anatomy. We live peacefully, we live longer, we live more healthily. Now, ecologically, just very briefly, if people are vegetarian, 60% of the gas for transportation could be saved in the United States. A vegetarian saves about an acre of trees a year. A vegetarian requires about 1,200 gallons of water per day as compared to 4,200 gallons of water for non-vegetarians. 16 times more people could be fed on a vegetarian diet as can be fed on a meat-based diet. Now, this is what I wanted to get to. The spiritual dimension of eating. According to the Bhagavad Gita, God has made an arrangement for our well-being and for our sustenance. But if we take those foods without acknowledging or offering back to him, then we're eating only sin. Even that carrot, even that, those sprouts, as little amount of pain as we cause by eating them, if we take them without offering or acknowledging that God created them and God is providing them for us, yes, there will be karma even for a vegetarian diet. To take your diet from a mode of goodness level to a spiritual karma-free level requires recognizing that God created everything, and here's the kicker, God owns it, and God has the first right of enjoyment. Now, when we say grace, we thank God for the food that he gave us. That's good. Gratitude is a great virtue. It's the parent of all other virtues. When you offer the food, you take portions of the food that you've cooked, you put them on a plate, and you put them on the altar, bow down for a few seconds, and acknowledge that God, you created the food, you own the food, you have the first right of enjoyment, not me. That goes to the next level. That is spiritualizing your food. And because God is the enjoyer, you grow the food if you can. You prepare it. You harvest it. You cut it. You cook it. You offer it to God. He is the beneficiary. So if there's any karma, quote unquote, he absorbs it. The difference between vegetarian food, which is not offered, and vegetarian food, which is offered, they're two different names. Unoffered food is called boga. That means you prepared it for your enjoyment, you get the karma. Food which is prepared with God's satisfaction in mind is freed of all karma, and it even has a different name. It's called prashadam. We're coming up on 6 o'clock. If you have any questions, we can spend another two or three minutes for questions before we go have the arctic ceremony, and then I hope that at the very least... This has made you guys really eager to taste some consecrated spiritual prashad. <laughs> Any questions at all? Yes. You spoke about the vegetarian diet, and lately it is a lot more possible of vegan diet. How do you compare these two with just a pure body? And just, What's not there in a vegan diet is the ability of milk to create finer tissues in the vein. There's a special capacity to understand scripture, to understand God, which is accessible through a diet that includes some dairy. Veganism can give you pretty much everything you need nutritionally. You can't fault it from any nutritional point of view. You're getting 
your proteins, you're getting your carbohydrates, you're getting, you're get, you can get everything physically and even mentally according to normal parameters, you can have full radiant health on a vegan diet. But what you can't get, and that's not quite so obvious, is that keen, subtle, sublime intelligence to pick up on spiritual culture and spiritual subject matters. And that's why great saints like Narada Muni and Sukadeva Goswami, Vyasadeva and all valued milk so highly. Many people are vegan because of the cruelty to the animals. And of course, we don't subscribe to that at all. Wherever possible, our Krishna communities raise their own cows. They get their milk from those cows and then they let those cows die a natural death. So we have a community like that and a couple of them in California. We have one in Pennsylvania. We have one in West Virginia. And those farms supply all the surrounding temples with pure raw milk. We're not close enough to any temple to do that. And we're not at the point where we can raise our own cows. Krishna is the cowherd boy. When Krishna and God descends, he has cows in such a special place of affection that he engages in the pastimes of being a cowherd boy the first six or seven years of his life. You cannot worship Krishna without offering Krishna the byproducts of the cow. If and when we're able, we'll do raw milk from cruelty-free dairies, but until then we just have to do what we can.